and then I'm going to switch to this other one. I'm going to, oh, and all of our uh, normal things that you've been around, the, the, the mics are off for right now. We'll turn them back on later. Uh, the meeting is recorded. If you don't want your face on YouTube or anybody else's computer, you can turn off yours. Um, that's up to you. We also ask for courtesy in that if you're going to be eating your breakfast on the West Coast and you didn't bring enough for us, that you can mute or uh, turn your camera off while you're eating. If you need to get up and leave for a minute, uh, make sure you're dressed appropriate or turn your camera off. They're supposed to be, and I can't find it again, under reactions, there was, I found one time where it says, I'm stepping away for a second. So I am going to start. I'm playing. raising my hand. Oh, I was looking at my other computer. I've I got knew two that. screens. But yes, I, really, I really didn't raise my hand. Uh, I just looked and I don't have that coffee cup or I'm, you know, you out of here. Okay. Change. Anyway. Um, John just mentioned that you should put your first and last name in the chat box if that is, or if you have something to say. But uh, if you're going to put anything in the chat box, you don't need to put anything other than your name. I don't need the name of your group. I don't need your email address because as I put everything together, I just have to fix everything and delete all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And as a reminder, uh, this is, we're going to have a, just a short presentation that I'm going to put do. And today is mostly going to be a questions and answer time for uh, people. And you have the option. If you're somebody who doesn't really like to raise your hand and speak out questions, you can put them in the chat box to Judy. Make sure to go to Judy, not to any of us. She's got them all. Uh, if you want to, uh, you know, verbally ask questions, you know, you have two options when it's time. And I've, I really raised my hand this time like I'm supposed to. Oh, yes, uh, I see it. As I would tell my um, computer students, when they would not, at, you know, raise their hand to ask a question, uh, adults sometimes perceive that they think somebody's going to think <clears throat> they're stupid because they ask a particular question. There are no stupid questions. There are only clarifying questions. And even looking at the uh, view of all the little squares, if someone asks questions, I can see people going like this. So... <clears throat> for those <clears throat> those people who don't want to verbalize it, like he said, put it in the chat box. But take a leap and remember, there are only clarifying questions. Right. And and if you don't want to see the strip that's going down the side of the screen right now. You go up to the top where it says, you're viewing my screen, hit the more, and then you can say, oh, hide that panel. And you won't see it anymore. Get this started up. And another thing I found out too is that when your Zoom is popping up uh, chats and eat people in, it interferes with your opening up things. Welcome to our Learning Linux Beginners. Also, happy birthday to all of us Linux users and those who are going to become maybe Linux users. Uh, it's a special day. 30 years ago, Linus was playing around in his graduate course and messing with the kernel and put together something. He thought, hey, here's a fun thing. Look what I created. See what you think of it. And it has just blossomed into uh, a huge, huge number of Linux versions. And as we've talked before, uh, 
There is so much Linux in the background that you don't see. Uh, you're using Linux all the time. Today, the goal is this is a day of review and maybe something new. We've had a long trip up this mountain towards Linux. And I got to thinking that all along the way, some of our hikers might be drifting kind of to the back of the line. And I think it's time that we kind of take a little stop at an outlook and look back over the path that we've come and to allow the beginners to say, this has all been good, but I need some refreshment. I need to go back. And so today it's going to be beginner's day. And we'll talk that the questions are going to be beginner kind of questions. I want the people who are new to Linux, the people who are interested in learning about Linux to leave today with a better understanding of the basics and not a head full of uh, ideas that I just don't kind of understand. Our Linux team that is with us today is Orv Beach and Carl Esnault, and I am here too. I told the other guys that today I will be answering all the yes and no questions because I'm guaranteed a 50-50 chance of getting it right. What I wanna do is do a visit to some of the past workshops that we've done and kind of just do a quick review that'll help maybe you to say, oh, I had a question about that. Oh, I need them to tell me again about that. This is gonna be a question and answer and a show and tell day. We've got three of us that are gonna be able to show you whatever it is maybe you wanna see. So here is why most of us that are Linux people use Linux. We talked about that it's free. You don't have to buy anything. If there is any time that somebody tells you that you have to pay for it, that's wrong. You might have to pay for somebody to put it on a disk or a thumb drive to send to you, but that's only if you don't want to do it yourself. There are no fees required, no update costs. Everything is kind of coming through free. It's open source. We've talked about that in my analogy to potlucks. The, the uh, code is totally open to everyone for review, for modifications, for improvements. It's more secure partly, mainly because of open sourceness and all the sub points that, you know, dealing with security issues, uh, it's there. At, at the uh, Chicago Linux group last night, we did talk about the fact that sometimes it's a little bit harder to do some things in Linux because you have to deal with the security that protects you. And sometimes in Windows, you can just go ahead and do stuff, leaving things a little bit uh, vulnerable. Um, Another big thing is that it's compatibility with older soft, older computers and low-end hardwares. You've got computers that can't run newer Windows and newer Mac OSs because they just will not meet the requirements. But I can almost assure you we can find you a Linux that will run on that computer and bring that computer back to life. Another reason that we are Linux users is there's a great deal of customization. And you can make Linux look and feel, meet your needs however you want. We even have, a, I had a video of somebody I follow, took a Linux and converted it into a Windows 11 type of machine with the idea that says, you know, wow, Windows 11's coming out, here's all the greatness. It's been in Linux, most of this stuff before. So he said, look, here's how we make our Linux a Windows 11. We can make it a Windows 10. You can make it look like and act like a Mac machine, or you can make it look like the personal machine that is a free John Linux machine. No hassling to updating. 
It's so easy. A lot of times it happens in the background and you're not bothered. You very rarely get a message that says, you got to reboot now. And Linux has so much computer comp community support that if you've got a question or problem, there's somebody out there that's going to answer it. You don't need to be on some big payroll for tech support somewhere because the forums and the Linux groups, I learned something new last night at our Linux group that I never knew. Uh, so everybody's out there. So there's no excuse. You just need to know how to go and ask the questions. Uh, oh, we, we talked about distros and that's the biggest, hardest thing to understand because in the Windows world, Linux world, there is one and only one. Um, yeah, you can, you know, move some stuff around whatever but in the linux world there is hundreds and hundreds that for those who saw for a quick bit the uh, mike's uh, background it was kind of a family tree shows all of the splitting that we have from that it's just like cars and i always do a presentation for beginners and talk about why there's so many linux because there are so many cars the main variations that have come from the big back that have been around for you know nearly 30 years, we've got the Slackware, Debian, Red Hat, Arch Suzy or Suse, and Gentoo. And then what we've happened is because of this open sourceness of the recipe, we have all of these that have come from Debian. We've gotten Ubuntu, Mint, Elementary, Zorin. From Red Hat, we've got Fedora, PC Linux OS. From Arch, we've got Monjero and Endeavor OS. And OpenSUSE came from a combination of Red Hat and others. From Gentoo, we've got Redcore and Funtu. And there are many, many more. A lot of them have come and gone because who people who developed them just don't have the time to develop them. Some of them got developed and nobody was really interested in them. And others, you know, there, there's, a, there's a version of Linux for every possible uh, kind of, uh, kind of uh, user. Long month. Uh, then we talked about the desktop environment. And again, in Linux, you have one. You can make some changes to it. I mean, in Windows. But in Linux, we have tons of them. And the desktop environment is actually the whole computing experience. It's all the stuff I'm not, you know, we talked about it a bit before of all the stuff that goes on that desktop that you can see. And the ones that we have that are most, the most common ones, the KDE Plasma and the GNOME 3 and 40. And we just had a workshop on the GNOME 3 and 40 last time. And uh, KDE, the XFC, these have been around for a long time but have changed over the years. One of the newest ones for lightweight is LXQT. Then we have the things where people said, I didn't like what they were doing. I didn't like the direction they were going. Open source says, you're free to do whatever you want. So when GNOME went to three, people didn't like it. So they modified it and came out with a desktop called Cinnamon. Another group said, we didn't even like three to modify it, we're going back to the GNOME 2 and start from there and modernize it. And we have the Mate desktop. And even some people said, we don't like what KDE has done with their plasma. So we're going back to pre-plasma. That's Trinity. And it's not that it's old, it's modern, but it's using some style and looks and whatever that people like back there. And then we have the more modern ones that have kind of built their own Enlightenment and Pantheon and Budgie, Deepin, and there's others. Uh, everybody's coming up with their own little uh, change in uh, the desktop. And it's just a matter of like cars. You get into one and you see how comfortable you fit with it. And most of us, have our favorite ones. Not that any of the others are, are bad or not. It just, you know, I, I just like the fit feel of this one. Orv likes KDE. Somebody else likes this. I kind of like the Mate right now. 
XFCE has always been a favorite because it's just been so simple and whatever. And then we talked about software. There is so much software available in Linux that it is a problem. It's a problem for me because I sometimes can't decide which desktop I like, which distro I like, which software that has five or six different cousins that all do the same thing. And I can have whichever I want, which one is it I'm gonna settle on? And so sometimes on my computers, I have two or three things that do the same job and it depends on how I feel during the day. And the nice thing about Linux is they have a software store that can have tens of thousands of what we call packages that have software for anybody's you know, interest. And you can put whatever you want on your computer as long as you stick with the fact that, uh, like in a car, you if you've got a diesel engine car, you've got to put diesel fuel in it. But you can go to any gas station that has diesel fuel and put it in there. If you're a gasoline one, you can go to any gasoline and put gas in there, but you can't put diesel in your car. So the same thing here. Uh, usually software manufacturers will make a number of variations of the same software that work for the different package managers or the different, uh, usually it's easier to say the different distributions. So like Debian and Fedora and OpenSUSE, you know, they have certain kind of software that they run on. So as long as if you're running anything Debian, then you can run anything that any Debian would do. And the same thing like with Arch, Gentoo. So you've got a lot of variety, but you do have to, you know, stick with your, the family you're running in. And then we talked about test driving. All of you that are interested in learning about Linux, there is no cost to you to try it. See if you like it. There are two good ways. I won't say which is the best because that's up to you, but there are two great ways. One way is to just do a virtual testing. And if you go to distrotest.net, you'll be able to start up a browser version of hundreds of Linux and you can try it out. Now at the distro test site, it might be, you might have to be in a waiting line to get your turn to get to access to their servers or whatever, but Still, it's no, no, all you do is a couple clicks, click on the alphabet that starts the distro you want to do and click on it and say, start it up. And it does everything else for you. You can try it out, see what you like. I, I will tell you, it probably doesn't respond as fast as it would if it was installed on your computer because you're running it over the internet from some server somewhere in the world. But you don't have to do anything. You don't have to download anything. You don't have to make anything. You just go to that site. I want to try this one out. I want to try this. And they do all the work in the background and you get to play with it. The other way that we have people check out uh, Linux is using a live media. In the older days, we all put disks and burned uh, images and operating system. And then we would pop in a CD or a DVD as they got bigger and boot to the DVD and we would be running Linux. Nowadays, the disks are pretty much obsolete. So we put them on thumb drives and then you pop a thumb drive, a USB thumb drive into your computer, boot it to that and you're running Linux on the thumb drive without doing anything to your computer. So you have a chance to do that. But with that version, you will have to <clears throat> download the, what we call an ISO, which is the uh, operating file that installs and runs. And then you'll have to burn it or copy it to a thumb drive. But we have a couple of programs that are good ones that will share that. And so once you put it on that, you do it. Then what's nice is because you haven't paid for it, you can wipe that out and put a different one on to try. 
And then one, finally, when you feel this is the one I want, install it on your computer and you run with it. And then later on you say, well, you know, I don't like that so much. Well, go get another Linux. It's free and throw it on there. As opposed to paying for a Windows or a Mac, once you pay for it, you're gonna kind of stick with it because you paid for it. But with Linux, you can switch. We have those people that do that, we call them distro hoppers. And there are some people that hop every month and they put a different distro on. And we also talked about the scary thing, and that is the terminal. Computer people go far back before the Windows graphical interface. We go back to the old days of text-based DOS computers and everything was typed. And then people said, let's make it easier. And we got the graphical GUI. But Linux has the best of both. They've got a good graphical interface and they have access to the terminal, which is all text-based. Doing things in the terminal sometimes are faster and easier, and you can get more done in a terminal than you can on the graphical side. But this is something that you gradually add. We try not to dump too much on new people with the terminal because it scares them off. But we will gradually say, hey, if you go and do this, you can do this then. And then gradually, more and more, you learn about that and become something that, that you might want to use. But the bottom line is, I know lots of Linux users that never, ever use the command line. And that's the way it was with Windows. A lot of Windows people don't realize until recently when they've got the new shell script and stuff like that, that there was a command line in Windows, but people hardly ever went to that. They just used the graphical, but there was one. Same as with in Linux. But we don't want terminal to terminate your consideration of Linux. You don't have to use it, but when you learn about it, you finally say, oh, I like being able to do this. But bottom line, don't. You don't have to. So as I come to the end, here's what our goals are for today. I want to answer your beginner's questions, period. That's it. This is not advanced class. This is not even maybe intermediate. If we get to question something like that, we might say, hey, let's hold that off until the end, until we make sure that we've got all of these beginners. I don't want anybody who's taking the stop with us today on the hill overlooking the valley and say, I'm going back down. This is too much over my head. Not today. You ask, we'll try to answer. We'll try to do things with showing, telling, demonstrating. And I want the kind of questions. Judy and I are both early childhood educators. I spent 25 years in first grade before I moved to middle school computers. And I'm keyed in to people who need to ask things like, tell me that again. I heard it before, tell it again. Maybe I'll understand it. And we have three people on our panel today and three different ways that people might explain something and you'll finally understand it from one of those. I want people who have been around the learning about Linux to say, show me something here. You showed us something back then, went too fast. I don't remember. You said how good it was. Show me. Explain it again. I have no problem as a teacher having somebody say, "Tell, ask me again. Tell me again. Help me understand. That's one of my key things help you to understand what I like so well and Orv likes and Cal likes and some few others that are here. This is gonna be your turn to ask those questions. And as Judy said, there are no silly, simple, whatever questions. These are questions that are important to you as the beginner.
or the person who is wondering about Linux. And here are my fun questions that I always ask, you know, my Linux group, the people who are really not strong. What's holding you back from switching over to Linux? We have been telling you all about this good stuff for months now. What do you still need to know so you can make the switch? I'm not going to say, why are you still using Windows or Mac? I'm just going to say, what's holding you back? What do you need to know so that you can make this change over into Linux? Because as we've shown you, it's just an operating system like a car. I'm sure there's been a lot of you people who have driven one make of car and then you switch to another one. I don't know the reasons, but there's lots of reasons you make a switch. So these are the kind of questions that we want to have. And so, as we said before, you can either put them into the chat box and Judy will then ask us. Or you can, when we switch in a little bit to use your virtual hand, raise your hand, and then Judy can call on you and you can ask those questions and we'll try to help you. Orvin Cal, any, any other general comments you'd like to make before we start into the question answering period? I think you covered it pretty well. Yeah. Um, okay. Go ahead. All right, so, okay, so let's get, into, let's get to answering and asking questions and use the chat box or do you virtual hand and I'll give everybody the okay to, to do that. And you have that kind of permission. I will stop sharing so we can see everybody and then, uh, We've got quite a number of people here. Oh, great. Over 40 other people besides our team on here. So I guess, Judy, I'll turn my back on. And uh, oh, there okay. we and wish everybody happy birthday again. 30 years. It's great. <laughs> and it's going to keep going. It's not, it's not going to go anywhere. Linux is here to stay. Uh, from John Carter, I believe he's with the Prescott Group. And he had a couple of comments and he said, if you want to spend some money, you can regarding Linux because you can buy some advanced applications. So there's that. And uh, he thinks the biggest issue with Linux any di in any distribution is finding or creating the driver needed to access a given peripheral device for a given application. So how hard is it to do that? Well, if, if uh, Tim was here from last night, uh, and Orv's going to answer that, he would tell you that there is no problem. Orv, go ahead. Oh, you're muted. I was going to say the same thing. Over the last 25 years or so of Linux maturing, um, they have rounded up the drivers for the vast majority of common and some uncommon peripherals. Um, and the bulk of the most common ones are included in all distros. And the less common ones frequently you'll find in the distros repository, not installed by default, but loadable. You don't have to go off and search some obscure vendor site. It's become a non-issue, honestly. Yeah. Um, and Cal, pipe in any time. Uh, most installations, when you do a Linux installation, has a feature that says, go out and check for my drives. And it will look to see if you need to have something that's not already included. Uh, and it'll tell you, you don't need any drivers, or here is a better driver for that particular device. Yeah, the, the one exception is the very high-end uh, graphics cards and GPUs. Uh, frequently, uh, because the vendors have not been forthcoming and releasing details of the designs, the Linux drivers tend to lag behind the proprietary ones. Um, the, the binary, the blobs, you know, not, not open source. And, but there are very well-defined procedures for going out 
and getting those frequently, they're in the repositories and they're pretty well documented on how to install them. These would be the, the, the high-end gaming uh, graphics cards. And yeah, I think the, the other end uh, printers, old printers, I've had problems and uh, there's something uh, open printing or Guten print there if you Google you'll find that uh, they are available and you can uh, load them up so that that's the other issue uh, if you have a real old printer sometimes yeah yeah and a, f a few of the printer vendors are open source hostile um, <laughs> uh, like Cal mentioned openprinting.org they have a whole repository of printers and their ratings, how compatible they are from completely supported down to the bottom. Uh, it's a brick in Linux. The other thing, it's amazing how many different printers there are out there from each different printing company. You know, I don't understand why are they making so many different models, but like or, or said, this list will go way down, 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 and you're going, I, I you know, you can't always expect Linux people who are working on a project that nobody is giving money to individually, trying to maintain and make sure every one of those uh, peripherals will work with every 100, 200 Linuxes. The, the nice thing about um, Linux is if a vendor comes out with a new variation of a product that needs a driver. Very frequently, it's not a new driver in Linux. It's a mildly tweaked version of an existing driver that can now accommodate whatever uh, particulars are different about that printer. So it's fairly easy for them to keep up with new variations of existing products in general. What is the app for loading multiple ISOs on a single thumb drive and where do you get it? Aha. Let's see. It fits. It is right. Let's see. Put it right in front of my face. There. It's right there. Uh, it's Ventoy is the one I use. V-E-N-T-O-Y. And you use that to create a special thumb drive. It's not hard at all. You, you know. You get that software, stick in the thumb drive and say, make it. And then all you do is copy ISOs, just copy. No installing, no nothing, just copy them over. And then when you put the thumb drive into your device, a menu will come up and say, you've got these different uh, Linux, which ones do you want to try today? Or which one at a time do you try today? So yeah, V-E-N-T-O-Y and a very simple process and uh, I think my, you know, you only, you know, and the size of thumb drive just depends on how many uh, distros you want to put on at a time. And then you can just easily delete a file and then add a different file. What is a swap file? Oh, I want to give somebody else. That wasn't a yes and no question for me. <laughs> Okay. okay. Swap, um, swap file. <laughs> Go ahead, Cal. File or a, a swap partition is uh, a space on your hard drive in case your memory exceeds uh, its capacity. And it will swap out something in your memory, put it on a hard drive, and then when it needs to, it'll swap it back in. And uh, that used to be very necessary when we had two gig and one gig hard drives. With a four gig, uh, barely needed. With an eight gig, I've never had to use it. Uh, I've never seen it really come into action unless you're doing a lot of video. So if you have a more modern machine with eight gigs, uh, you don't have to know about it. But that's what it's for. Yeah, one more comment on that. Um, used to be swap partitions were heavily favored over swap files because they were more efficient. But in the recent iterations of the Linux kernel, there's no difference in performance. However, even if your drive is a solid state drive, it's 
far slower than uh, your your native memory. So having to swap stuff in and out because you're low on memory is the kiss of death to performance. If you ever see your swap file size going up significantly, it's an indicator you need more RAM. And even if you uh, have plenty of RAM, you'll notice that um, occasionally Linux will use a little bit of uh, 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 swap memory as scratch pad. So it's probably a good idea to keep at least a small swap file or swap partition around for Linux. Yeah. But yeah, uh, not having enough RAM is the kiss of death for every operating system. Yeah. Doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. You know, if you think back in your Windows days, for some of you, I can remember that you could take a thumb drive, plug it into your computer, and mark it as a extra memory for your computer. And that's kind of like what we do with par uh, swap partitions in Linux. That way we don't have to plug something in. Um, remember, if you have questions, send those to Judy so she can monitor those. Uh, it's easier that way because the presenters don't always see if you're trying to send to, to us that way. So please send questions to Judy and then she can pass them on to us. I got a ton. Yeah. George, I'll get to you in a minute. Uh, Bill wants to know, since Linux run, runs on older hardware, which can be a security risk because some security features are hardware based, how does Linux address those issues? Um, well, let's, let's, <laughs> that's not a one, that's not a one sentence answer. Um, the way for maintaining the best security for any operating system is keeping your patches up to date. Uh, additionally, don't run things you don't need to. Don't run stuff in the background. Uh, like don't run a web server on a Linux box if you don't need a web server. Um, Linux lately in the last year and a half has become very proactive and maintaining firmware updates in the repository. And now occasionally a Linux box will tell you, your BIOS needs updating. Here, shall we do it? And you know, it'll download it, it'll reboot into the BIOS, install it, update it, and, uh, uh, and then reboot into the operating system. So that's one more step. Um, additionally, there are utilities, there are programs called rootkits um, that will weasel their way into the hardware. Um, keeping the BIOS uh, versions updated helps against that. Additionally, there are uh, programs that will detect rootkits. Uh, I think check rootkit is one of them. I run one of them occasionally, not very often, but Linux security is significantly better. And if you <laughs> maintain good Linux um, sanitation, uh, you'll be in good shape. So you're saying it's kind of like a Chromebook. Um, yeah, pretty much. But, you know, Chromebooks have hardware that need to be updated re occasionally, too. And what really drives Bill crazy are all the strange names that are given to things. He's our f file explorer person, <clears throat> and he wants to know why they have such silly names. My word is silly. Uh, what? Because yeah. they can't? <laughs> yeah, I guess I'd have to say, you know, what examples, you know, uh, folders and, and files, those are the two main words that we use in our system and everything is a file and kept in folders. No, that's not what he's talking about. Things okay. will have Aquaman or something like that. And he, yeah. how do you figure out with Aquaman, you know, what that relates to in our Windows brain so we can know what Aquaman does. I have no idea what Aquaman is. So well, I, I just made that yeah. up. Well, but, just, but, you know, you've got to come with more specifics because I don't see anything that, that has names. People make up, you know, like, the, like the, uh, the Linux family that I run in is called Debian. Why? Because the guy who invented it, his name was Ian. His wife's name was Debbie. So Debian. Very good. 
And the red hat is the symbol that they've got a red hat, just like window symbol is a window. That's why we call it window. Well, um, I can see where he's coming from because the file right. manager for KDE Plasma is Dolphin. Thank you. That, that was that was Dolphin. That's exactly what he's talking about. Okay. All I don't right. Know why. Well, you know, I didn't remember Dolphin. And okay. the, yeah. Go the ahead. image viewer uh, that they use is called uh, Gwenview. Yeah. I, to, I don't to, know. To make Bill happy, we have um, versions of Linux that I don't like because all they use is file manager, viewer, document. You know, they are very generic names. Now, uh, if you go to talk about the uh, Debian distro, he liked the movie Toy Story. So every version of Debian, and number 11 just came out, is named after a character in Toy Story. Well, that's its nickname. It's Debian yeah. 11. Right, <laughs> the nickname. And it's interesting because there's one name that never gets applied to a new version of Debian named, um, <laughs> boink, um, because it's the testing one. And it's named after the kid that lived next door that liked to blow up things and destroy things. So they have their testing unstable, always is, it has that name, Sid. Sid, the, Sid, yeah. yeah. His name was Sid. So the Sid is always the one that they are starting with and molding and is dangerous. And then as soon as it's stable, it goes to a name like Woody or any of the names in, in that. Uh, um, Buster. Yeah. Uh, we, we also have uh, people that, it's like naming streets. I have favorite names. That, so when I develop a, a housing, we make strange names. Um, so the reason for the dolphin and stuff, the first, uh, one of the first file managers was called Nautilus. Obviously, somebody who liked 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. So Nautilus was the file manager original. When they modified it, those that are using the Cinnamon desktop, they modified the Nautilus. It's called Nemo, who was the captain of the Nautilus. Yeah, one, one thing I should state. Go ahead, Kyle. Hey, a program name is copyrighted. You cannot use the same name if you come up and you want to have a separate product. Every time a Linux uh, is forked or a copy, or another version is made, they have to change the name and strip out any references to the previous name. That's a copyright legal issue. Yeah. Now, what names they use these are programmers, and programmers are kind of silly. So yeah. That's, that's, yeah. That's the silly name. But the reason is if a new version comes out, you are prohibited from using the same name. Yeah. And, and coming from the Windows world, there is only one. And so it's always been that way. We've had Word for generations. It started back there, and it's still going. Word is the name for that because that's and the only choice or LibreOffice's writer. Yeah. And in KDE Plasma, the text editor editor is called Kate. In this case, that's the KDE advanced text editor. So it does have some meaning. Uh, Judy, I got a question in the chat that I have to answer. Hmm. <laughs> Somebody asked what the question on my t-shirt was. Yeah, stand up. You have to talk so we can see it better. You may ask yourself, how do I you read those? This? Yeah, yeah. Does anybody recognize the song or the band? Mm -mm. <sighs> Talking Heads. Yes, oh. of course. <laughs> so we my daughter gave me that. So you know, to answer Bill's thing, yes, it's a problem because Linux. We get a variety of programs that do the same thing because somebody said, I like what they did here, but I'm going to make this better. 
I'm going to make it act better. So I coming up with a different one with a name. I use in, in uh, the Mate version, the file manager's Kaja. You know, the desktops all have different names. And in KDE Plasma, the paint program is called Color Paint, K-O-L-O-U-R Paint, because in KDE, traditionally, not so much anymore, all of the programs started with K. Yeah. And KDE itself was a spinoff on the very old original Unix CDE graphics uh, environment, and which common desktop environment it stood for. Mm -hmm. But in KDE, it was the cool desktop environment with a K, but yeah. it's just KDE now. Yeah. But historically, like Conqueror with a K was the uh, original browser, but not so much anymore. Yeah. I just so, have the yes or no question, okay? Oh. Is there anything based on Star Wars? Of course. Okay, uh, over to you, George. If we have a satanic Linux, there's got to be a Star Wars Linux. Okay. You asked why we have not switched over. Okay. Yes. Um, I have switched my, first of all, I think it's an option for people who have more than one computer. Um, the reason I haven't switched my main computer is there's some programs that won't run on Linux. I do some circuit emulation. I need LT Spice. It just won't run. There's no Windows version. Of it. There's no Linux version of it. Um, so I would switch over if there was an easy way to view my Windows box from my uh, Linux box. But uh, basically, it's a pro program. And I'm not a, I don't do peripherals and all that. So it's not a matter of peripherals, although I guess the printer is probably there. Um, so I'm, I'm not running all kinds of audiovisual peripherals on this thing. But the fundamental problem of, of common consumer programs not running on Linux, uh, even I don't know if Adobe runs uh, their suites does, on, does on not. Linux. So, you know, you got a whole bunch of people who are using Adobe uh, Photoshop and, and things like that. So I could move off running Windows as my main computer and run Linux but I need an easy way to view the Windows computer. Yeah. Well, that's easy and, enough. Yeah, virtual desktop. Well, yeah. um, if you just need to view it, you can use something like VNC or RDP. You know, we went over that briefly, one of the previous ones. Yeah. I run nope. VNC to look at my Raspberry Pis, but the, the resolution isn't great. Yeah. Well, that's a function of the Raspberry Pi, I think, but... Um, I use a Linux program called KRDC to manage uh, a Windows 10 VM off in my ham shack in the other part of the house, and it works fine. Yeah, you know, commenting about his his comment, and it's true. You know, you are one of the small percentage that has to have a few programs that a company chooses not to make available on Linux. But my comment is that in my computer club of like 200 people, there may be two or three people that use Adobe. So if you're talking that small of a percent, you know, I have been using Linux, you know, since the almost not quite 20 years. Um, I have, don't use o Adobe uh, products. I don't do what you do. So it's a no a no issue for me, but I do know that there are people who, you know, have to use it. So for you guys, go. In my presentations, when I talk about cars, the same thing would be a family of five or six people can't do a smart car. It just won't fit. There's only two seats. So you have to go with a bigger van. Uh, but I'm talking to the people who don't do Adobe Photoshop, that don't do a special CAD program. George, you need to stick with it, or you might be able to do a virtual machine inside of Linux and run your program that way. Also, that was my suggestion, a virtual box. I'm glad. And that's John Carter's thing, too. He has astronomy programs that aren't, don't work with Linux. There are 
Yes, but there are a ton of equivalent programs written for Linux. Um, oh. Yeah. <laughs> ah, we just had a fantastic GIMP presentation. Yes, and, uh, and that's multi-platform. Seriously, I mean, there's just a few little things that you can't do in GIMP that you can do in Photoshop. And, you know, Linux came up through the engineering world. There are a ton of SPICE equivalents for doing circuit simulation. Um, you could investigate those. And as far as astronomy, um, there are a ton of astronomy programs. Um, I can only think of K-STARS right now, but all, um, more, more and more of them can do uh, scope, telescope control and stuff like that. I don't have a scope, so I don't know too much about that. There's um, three or four other really good astronomy programs. You know, and, and you, you got to you know, consider if the thing that's on Mars now running around on the ground is being powered by Linux, there's got to be software that is taking care of NASA's needs out there in space. Um, so I'm sure that there are astro and astronomy stuff and other things that, that are out there, but we just don't know about it. And that's another reason that people don't know as much about Linux is because we don't have a big marketing pocket. You know, Microsoft has all that money in Apple from what they charge, so they can advertise like crazy. But again, Linux is something you're not giving any money for unless you donate. So where are they going to get money to do development and advertisement? Okay, we're going to be here till next week. I've got 17 questions here. Some <laughs> of them go on like this. Oh, we got an hour. I'm going to ask three easy ones. Your lips are zipped until I say all three. Thank you. What is a distro? What is an ISOS, ISOS? And how do I get a distro? And any recommendation, and I'm going to put the word easy in, on which one to start with. I'm shocked, John oh. Kennedy. Well, I, I, I have a team. I'll let you go with that, John. Okay. Okay. A distro is a distribution. And it would be the same as a car manufacturer. It is a company that starts with all the parts. And we start with what's called the kernel. Today's the 30th birthday of it. Um, and you build on it. And then they add features to it. And then out comes a distro like Debian. Then we had the very first one that came out, which was Slackware. They started with that same kernel, added some things, different things, and out comes Slackware. So it's just like a car manufacturer. It's a different distribution of a same operating system, but with maybe different look and feel. Okay, could I, could I say, is it like this? That if Windows was open source, and we could have a Windows 10, a Windows 10.5, a Windows 10.6, because people have added something different in the coding to 0.5 and 0.6 and things like that. Is that a good comparison? I would say no, that it would be more like a Windows. <laughs> and then we took Windows and made it a little bit better. And we're going to call it shutters. And somebody else said, oh, I think I like what you do, but I'm going to change it, and it's going to be storm window. Storm window, yeah, or okay, patio. Thank you. Patio. Thank you. Maybe Screens. that'll help. You have to remember we still have our windows hats on. Well, I can, that's why I do it by cards. You know, yeah, I know, but, but change that to windows, like you just you said. Can. There's and only then, one. <laughs> then people, then people, I think might get it. Yeah, it's like in the beginning, there was only a Ford. Everybody drove a Ford. Everybody mm -hmm. drove the Model T. Everything looked the same. Everything worked the same. Everybody had to use the same color. Uh, okay, so so distro is just the fact that we have the ability to have different manufacturers coming out, and that's why we have. Well, the the uh, website that we talk about going to learn a lot about uh, Linux and their different versions is Distro Watch. They just list that they're there. It's not the top one hundred. And as, as, as uh, the, the picture behind uh, uh, Mike was, there are 
400 different lines coming down because each of those five main ones have branches off of them. Uh, so that's a problem. We got so many distros. What we tell people is find the, the distro you like, like I like Debian, Orb likes Debian. We pretty much stick with anything Debian. He likes Ubuntu. I like MX and I like Mint. Okay, second part. Oh, you just said, how do I get a distro? Oh, distro yeah. watch. Uh, distro watch is the easiest, distrowatch.com, because it's all there in one. Every distribution has its own website and you can you know, download from there. But I like to be safe and know that if I click here, I'm getting to the right spot. And so not only can you read about it, you can download them from that. Uh, or if you do the ISO, it's technical. Uh, in International Standards Organization. They def uh, when CDs first started coming out, the formats weren't defined. And uh, it was all over the map and you needed a specialized program to read a CD on a PC. Back then I might have even have been running DOS. So the International Standards Organization took it under their wing and it's ISO 9660 or something like that is the defined format for a CD and then a DVD. Um, that's why they're called ISOs because you originally, <laughs> originally got Linux distributions on floppy disks, then they went to a CD, then they went to two CDs, three CDs, then they went to a DVD. Well, those disks were in the ISO format. So any standardized CD-ROM or DVD-ROM reader could read them because it understood the format. They're not ISOs anymore. That's just what people call them. So I mean, we could just kind of erase that from our memory. We don't have to think about that now. No, nah, as long as you use a thumb drive, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Now, although uh, I, I think that's correct. Yeah. It, With think of it as just the, the Linux file that you use to install it. Windows has the same thing. In a sense, you download a file and you run it to install Linux or Windows on your computer. Okay, so John, yeah, what is the easiest one you can think of for somebody who is just starting out with Linux? Just name one. Linux Lite. Linux Lite. Orv. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm too far away from the beginners to make a recommendation, but ah! um, uh, uh, Ubuntu is good for beginners too. Any yeah. of the Ubuntu's. Yeah. Linux Mint, because it's uh, easy. It's based on Ubuntu, and it uh, looks almost like Windows. That's what I'm looking for. If yeah. you start, as far as I'm concerned, if you start, and remember, I don't know anything. Uh, if I were going to do it, I would want to ease into it with something that I'm familiar with. Yeah. And then when I get my feet wet and I finally figure out what in the world it does, then I can start branching out, like John says, to a different car. Yeah, and, and, you know, there are a couple of versions of Linux that are identical to Windows 10. They copy it so much that I think it's illegal, um, but, but uh, you can get one that you would think, and just as I told you, we, we, uh, my, this guy I watched, he took a Debian with a KDE desktop and made it look just like Windows 11 and kind of act like Windows 11. Okay, here's, that's a I, good thing. I have, no. tried, I have tried many Linux distros from Arch and Debian to Pear and Zorin, except from the user interface, the desktop environment, and the Linux kernel, what is really the difference from one to another? They all seem to have similar apps that come with them, and why do so many distros say they are based on Ubuntu, when Ubuntu is based on that husband and wife. Yep, because everybody says I can make it better. Or different. Or different. Why, when, you know, go ahead, Cal. Yeah, the reason they do it is that 70% of the programs are pre-compiled by Debian. And then another probably 24% are pre-compiled by Ubuntu. So a lot of people that build it on top don't have to do much work. And that's why they say it's the somebody, some company, some organization 
go through the trouble of compiling the open source into machine code for a PC. And when they say they're based on Ubuntu and Debian, that means they let somebody else compile the software and they just put the icing on the cake. Would that be yeah, I, like copy and paste and then you add your own stuff to it? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Can That's I get correct. down? I see, I can get down to the very bottom of all of these. Good areas. job. So, Good job. <laughs> honestly, I would suspect that uh, at least a third of all the distros out there are um, ego projects. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. My Linux. Judy Linux. Well, that's like Deb and Ian and Sig next door. Um, is there a Linux app store? Yes. Referring to, to uh, what I said in the presentation was that every distribution has its store. It's called a repository. And as Cal mentioned, they've all gone ahead and compiled it. So each distribution sends you to their store, but then you can go outside their store and get more. Or uh, Just a little history on that. Um, back in the early days, there was only one repository for Linux, and that was the, the vendor. Like uh, if you wanted Red Hat Linux, you would have to go to Red Hat to get all the updates. Well, as it got more and more popular, um, that site started to get overloaded with all the people downloading stuff. So what they did, they established mirrors. In other words, these are uh, identical repositories all over the internet, all over the world, and your machine would be directed to that one. All the mirror content were, were kept synchronized, uh, and that worked very, very well. And um, when the distros started using it, they called it a repository. When Apple developed the iPhone, they liked that concept so much, they used it, but they renamed it the App Store. <laughs> Thank you. That answers the question. Please repeat the link for the app to install multiple ISOs on a flash drive. John. Ventoy, V-E-N-T-O-I dot net. Even I can do that. I will. Uh, after, are there file compatibility issues with uh, Office, Corel Office, Sony SoundForge, and et cetera? Oh, well, I can take a stab at that if you want. Mm -hmm. Microsoft's file formats, and that is the main one everybody talks about, are proprietary and not well documented and not consistent between versions themselves. So being compatible with them is uh, always a work in progress. If you tried to open uh, a, like a, a Word 2000 document with Word 95, you'd be SOL. Um, so speaking of the ISO, there are ISO standards for documents, spreadsheets and files now and um, the ODA, the OD open, open document format, which LibreOffice uses, is an ISO standard now. So anybody can read and write to that standard. And those file formats are the default for LibreOffice. You can export out as a document, as a Microsoft Word document, if you want. And uh, like I said, it's a uh, work in progress, but now after 10 years of developing, um, exporting Microsoft, exporting in Microsoft formats out of LibreOffice is 99.98% mm -hmm. accurate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can import, you, you can transfer uh, Microsoft documents from computer to computer and still have them screw up. If somebody's used a unique uh, font, my uh, word will substitute and the best it can, but it'll look funny. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you Microsoft need to just Office a, now reads and writes open document format. Yeah. It does, so it goes, but it, 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 it does. Um, I've read that it doesn't do the greatest job, but yeah, you can go that direction. I would just tell everybody, if you need to send a document to people to look at, Send it as a PDF. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Always yeah. remember to do that. Out of that, I love it. I never knew what ODF stood for. 
I hope not. Um, and, and along with that, when I was doing my dual booting dozens of years ago, anything that I did in Windows outside of Word, but all, you know, plain documents, text documents, graphics, pictures, everything transferred back and forth. I could, I could open up something in, out of a file, a thumb drive or a you know, external drive that I had done in Windows, and I could open it up in the software I had in Linux. I could create something in Linux and save it and go to uh, Windows and open it because I started years ago with cross-platform software that reads both ways. So except for the Word, but yet, like I said, uh, LibreOffice could read most of the uh, uh, Word stuff. In fact, it was really funny because one year, I think when DocsX first came out, the people who were on the level below that couldn't read it, but uh, LibreOffice read it right away. Yeah. So I could translate for people. I'll yeah, just another one is another legal issue. All fonts are copyrighted. One of the things is that oh. if you have a Microsoft font that can't be used in a non Microsoft environment, Google has come up with alternatives, but that gets a little hairy, but that's, that's because the fonts have different spacing and kerning and all kind of technical stuff. Mm. But, uh, again, yeah. it comes back just like the naming. There is a legal reason why uh, if it's made proprietary, then they can't use those fonts and they have to come up with a workaround. And that has caused a lot of problems uh, precipitated by Microsoft, who wants to make this a problem. That's because they want to rule the world. Well, uh, they've gotten better. Um, yeah. I, I, I was just going to make a content, comment. For all of those file formats that are standardized, PNG, JPEG, uh, uh, RTF, uh, you know, you name it, uh, all of the Linux apps use common libraries for reading and writing them. So they're very, very standardized and very, very stable. The issue comes when you come with non-published, non-standard file formats and Microsoft files fall squarely in that camp. And that's all I'll say, say about that. Uh, with your uh, shirt that you're wearing, you're like Virgil Flowers in the John Sanford mystery stories, by the way. Uh, is there a glossary for all of the terms and acronyms? That would be fantastic. I'm sure DuckDuckGo could find them for you. There you go. Or you could Google it. So there. Uh, and John Carter reminds us that Affinity Photo, that he has just finished a I don't know if he's finished, but he's given two parts of a presentation to Prescott Computer Society and how to use it. But he says, anybody using Photoshop can switch to Affinity Photo. So there's GIMP or Affinity. Good to know. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Are there converters that move data from one program to another? For instance, if a picture is saved as a JPEG, and I need it to be read in Linux, what would I use? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, good. Thank you for raising your hand. Well, it's, it's not gonna be the answer that you totally want. Um, I just did that today with this background. I wanted it to be a PNG. And when I got it off the web, I just opened a program that is a cross-platform program and said, save as. Right, but you can use JPEGs in Linux. You can mm -hmm. use PNGs in Linux, so you don't have to change it to anything. No, no. if you don't have to, no. Yeah. Okay. And there is oh. a whole, there is a whole suite of programs uh, designed to convert files from one format to another. Uh, I use it on command line, but it's very, very versatile. You know, convert this.jpg to that PNG, concatenate these three PDF programs together, yada, yada, yada. Okay, here's a um, follow-up kind of to Bill's security question. Since I come from a Windows environment, I'm not familiar or comfortable with how to set up security for Linux. What are the most important security issues that I should deal with? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh. Okay, <laughs> go with it, go with it. Don't run as root if you don't have to. 
Absolutely. Now, hey, are, are, are you going to use a vest? Are you going to use? Uh, no, no, no. no. Um, the only antivirus programs widely used in Linux are those that run on mail servers and scan incoming mail for emails with Linux, with Windows viruses attached. The, the there big, aren't. Yeah. Go ahead, John. You, you can. Do well, this. it's just that the, the make of way Linux. Linux does not let you run anything unless you give it permission. So if, if a virus type thing tried to run, it can't run on its own. You have to give it okay. So as long as you don't okay anything that you don't know what's going on, um, most of the uh, viruses right now, the huge majority are written for Windows because Windows is so popular, they're going after them. And it's so, easier target too. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the, the Linux, where, where they've had a problem with Linux, it usually traces back to a human error. Somebody didn't update something that they were supposed to. Or, or they installed a program and left it with the default password. Oh, yeah. Um, the fact, you know, that I just mentioned that last night at the uh, uh, meeting, we wanted to uh, save something to a freshly formatted drive and they wouldn't let it because the program that you use to format creates a root owner. And if you're not root, you can't do anything with it. And you have to go into root to be able to change that. So it's a security issue all around. Is root like an administrator? Even higher. Okay. You use root and you could kill your machine. Uh, so I will ask this and then Cal is next. Um, you can't go to any Linux app store and find anything that says it's the XYZ security program for Linux. Clam, a, a clam, clam uh, AV is one of the main ones that's out there. Um, so yeah, there are, are a few uh, antiviruses and most of us, we would use it to scan something that Bill gave me that I knew came from Windows. I would scan it just to be safe. Or if I'm going to send something to a Windows person that was somewhere I got, I probably would scan to make sure that nothing is hiding that I'm passing on. Wear my okay. mask. Cal okay, the, the standard that I tell people to do with Linux is you save your personal files. If you ever get hacked, you completely rebuild your computer. In Linux, it's so easy because all the software, 90% of the software comes with the distribution already built in. So you completely wipe it out and you get a brand new fresh copy. So you never have, if anything should ever happen, you just wipe it out, bring back the system, connect it back to your personal files, which you should have backed up. So that's the security is you back up your personal files on an isolated system and you can always recover. I can recover in 15 minutes. Just like I can recover in 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, stop. Um, just like we always say to the Windows people, back up, back up. Okay, Cal, what is your recommended backup program? for Linux people? I do it manually. Never mind. Okay, or, I will tell you. I, you know, John. It have to be me because he'll do it the other way. Mint, Ubuntu, they all have their own backup program. And the one we were looking at last night, it's a like two clicks. Click back up my files to here. Right, but I'm just trying to, I, we talked about this on some slides for a presentation because I know about Clam AV. So I want right. somebody to say the name of one of those two cr cross-platform programs that you can back up with. Well, it's not even a you know, cross-platform. It's just the backup program that comes with Linux. And the name is? Backup. <laughs> That's for yeah, Bill. Every... That's for Bill. 
Don't make me look at old presentations. To, I'm going to, I'm going to duck, duck, go it. Okay, John. Every, Judy, every distro in the utilities area will have a backup program. And what it will be, okay. it will be a GUI shell for the standard backup uh, command line programs that come graphical, with every distro. That's a graphical user interface program. Yes. Okay. Mousy clicky. Yes. Uh, Kurt asks about Raspberry Pi. Kurt, our middle Wednesday workshop in September is going to be totally about Raspberry Pi. Uh, Dave says, uh, peer Linux looks and acts just like Mac OS. And they ask, can, he asks, can MS Office read an ODF file format? The absolutely yes is that. Now. Uh, Bill wants to use, can he use cloud storage with Linux? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I, I have I have access to OneDrive. Mm -hmm. I have access to Google Drive. I have access to P Cloud. I have access to iDrive. It's not working right now. So it's anything that has to do with cloud. There, it's it's that's that's common. Yeah, uh, John uh, from uh, Prescott. Let me know that he's doing a presentation this Saturday at PCS on Affinity Photo. Okay. What's in a photo? That's right. Um, he hasn't given number two. This is number two coming up on Saturday. So if you would like to uh, attend that meeting, John will put uh, their website address in the chat box and I will give it to everybody. And uh, you just need to uh, go to their website and click on the link and put your information in and they will send you a link and you are more than welcome to attend. Uh, Dennis is three-year-old Dell Optiplex 3050SFF has its original BIOS. He says, I found there's a newer BIOS on the web, Dell website, but he, he's reluctant to deal with it because it seems kind of complex. Can I update the BIOS after I convert to Linux and is easier or harder, harder to do it with Windows or Linux? Hmm. I don't know how hard it is to do in Windows, so there's no comparison. Well, is it difficult um, to do it in Linux? Well, anything's easy once you know how. Um, I don't believe the GUI updater yet accommodates firmware updates. It's a command line, but it's it's a one-liner, you know. I, it's just Google Linux how to update BIOS or something like that. It's a program called FW Update, you know, oh. firmware update. But you know, you know, you have to run it as root. And your distro has to have already downloaded the appropriate uh, um, BIOS firmware files. And it knows that because it knows what kind of hardware it's running on. So it will already be on your machine if you've uh, refre refreshed your local, local repository cache recently. Okay, he said that he's Does read that sound confusing? where you, when you're logging, when you're turning on your computer. And I can remember back in the day, you are pressing a key to get in ahead of everything. Get to BIOS. Uh, yep, to get to the BIOS. Yep. And you, um, but can you confirm that you have UFI boot BIOS that you must actually start up Windows before you can get into the BIOS and change it? And you gotta press that key like crazy and hope like heck that you do it in time. Well, I, I run a couple of Dell that. computers here. What was that? Kurt has an answer, I think. Oh yeah, up, upgrading a BIOS, whether it's conventional BIOS or UEFI or whatever it is, is really a hardware function. It's not an operating system function, although you may have operating system aids to do that. But gen generally now, you can take and download the BIOS, put it on a thumb drive, put that in a particular slot on the, on the computer, and the computer will see that when you power it up and take you into that That's into correct. function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 discovered, I, say I discovered that on this new machine and I accidentally plugged in, a, you know, probably my bootable drive into that USB and the computer started saying, hey, so I said, oops, that's not where I'm supposed to plug it in. 
what just to comment, most. What is the difference between MBR versus GPT? Ooh, not quite a beginner's one, but, uh, or finish up what you were going to say, and then yeah. we'll go to that um, one. Just uh, about the firmware updates. Um, the most recent uh, Linux utilities, you run the FW update program, tell it what file, updated file is available. It will reboot the machine for you, go directly into the BIOS, install it, and then reboot back into the OS. Clever machine, Linux. Mm -hmm. You and can take the MBR GPT. <laughs> <laughs> well, this guy is the same person with the UFIs and the BIOS and stuff. And he said he attended a Linux conversion, that kind of sounds like a church conversion, workshop with his computer group, and that was discussed, and he doesn't understand it. It's, it's based on hardware and the capabilities of how many times you can divide up a computer. The MBR is the old way that you created a hard drive with four partitions only. And if you um, wanted more than four, go ahead, or, or since you didn't um, That's not quite right. Um, the okay. MBR is the master boot record. It's the first track first sectors of the first track on the drive. And that's yeah. where it looks for information on where to load the boot okay. loader, which in loads the secondary loader, which loads the OS. That's the MBR. Um, GPT is, uh, what does it stand for? It stands for GNU. G-U-I-D partition table. Yeah. Well, thank you, you, Cal. I was just looking at that. It's a partition table, which is kept... That's the one you were thinking about that refers to where the partitions are on the disk and how those partitions themselves are formatted. It's a more modern version of um, the MS DOS one. Yeah. Yeah. It's way more modern, way more capable. Well, the, the startup, the old BIOS went to UEFI and the default of most Windows machines is they'll give you a choice in Linux. And so when you start up, you can have Linux go to the old system or go to the new UEFI system. Uh, it's a little more, yeah. how, most of the time, if you just start up and do it, it'll work. I mean, Linux can handle both. Um, some people like the old one uh, because they know how to deal with it. The new one, like John says, instead of having four petitions, you can have, I forget, it's 100 or something, 127 maybe. That's not important. It's, it's Linux, this is 10 years past that this transition was made, and most machines today don't even have a legacy boot, I think. Is that correct, Or I, I believe that's, that's true. Uh, and it used to be a big deal as they were transit transitioning from BIOS to EFI, then to UEFI, because uh, the Linux Linux distros had to be updated to accommodate it. But I think they're all past that now, so it's not a big deal for Linux, yeah. as long as you're installing the most recent Linux versions. Mostly with the, the partitioning, uh, the limitations of the old way with having four meant that if you wanted more than four, you had three primary, and then you had you know an extended one that could be divided a whole bunch of ways. With the new one, you just, however many you want, we can make them. And it's a lot yeah, simpler. And now, right? and now we're into volume management and all of this advanced stuff. Uh, I don't we, don't, do. we don't want to talk about that. No, no, I only, I, I'm still confused on volume. Yeah, your head will explode. Okay. Yeah, that's what, I just leave VLM where it is. Um, this is from Paul, who has no mic or cam when he uses his desktop PC. He's going to have to stop doing that. He says, uh, questions that he hears from Linux curious PC users. If I install Mint on a computer, not dual boot with anything else, and choose to switch to Ubuntu, for example, do I uninstall Mint and install Ubuntu? Or is there a more direct way of switching distros? What happens to my data files? Do I have to back everything up first? Is there a way to create a data only 
section or partition in Linux so that, so that switching from one distro to another is an is issue with losing data? Is such a data only section auto created during a distro installation process? That's a C drive and a D drive. And the answer is no, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. So yes, um, when you install, go back to that way. We, I always recommend that you do the installation where you have a separate home drive. I do that with Windows people and I do it with Linux. And that way, when you want to reinstall, as Cal said earlier, if in 10 minutes or so, you just blow out as, as a reinstall the new one, it wipes out the old one and puts the new one in. So it's simple. Somebody else had a question. If you were dual booting you know, a, a Linux, how do you get rid of the other one? You delete that partition. Just don't mess with your master boot record that tells where it is. You just delete it and then install something else. And your home then is always backed up. And when you reinstall, you just say, use that home, don't mess with it, just connect to it, and you're up and running. Uh, Mike Ungerman says, this is not really a beginner question, but, so he said it's a comment. He can't fully switch to Linux since he has to use Quicken for all his stuff. And he's tried anything that relates to Linux and they just don't work. He says he's now investigating Zorin, and they promote that they can run actual Windows EXE programs under their distro of Linux. Because they're running Wine. They're running what? Wine, W-I-N-E. Windows is not a... Uh, whatever. Emulator. Emulator. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, a program that they include. I don't have Wine on mine. Zorn has it automatically. And if you have a license for a product, you can then run a Windows if it is rated that it's compatible and you can run it under it. But there are issues of running Windows in a wine program because you're still running Windows. Um, yeah, I, I would always search to see if there's a web-based uh, client instead. So if you can get Quicken and it runs through your browser, in essence, uh, then it will run on any system you have. Uh, trying to run things like Quicken and some other things under Wine, uh, you can, there's, there's some issues that can arise. So that uh, nowadays we're going to, uh, lots of things you can just run through your browser. Uh, secondly, uh, there are containers. Uh, which is another subject that a lot of people are making that will run basically natively on Linux. And the other is that I'm not quite sure what all, you know, finance programs he's tried because I'm not, that's not one of my areas that I have names for things that are equivalent or will open up Quicken files. You know, I have a few. Okay, good. Uh, GNU Cache. Which is, which is the GNOME <laughs> money manager. Uh, KMY Money, KMY Money under KDE. And there's another one that I'm not real familiar with called Scrooge with a K. Um, I, I played with some early ones. They worked fine, but um, I didn't need one. I don't run a business or anything like that. Um, but they've all become better and better and better over the years, like all Linux or open source programs. John from Prescott says um, he used GNU cache is much better than Quicken, but converting the files can be the pits. And Mike says, sorry, there's no Quicken in browsers he checked. And I, as usual, I will say, how about using a virtual machine? Um, that would work. Yeah, and we also tell people that you know, if you have a, a, a Windows machine and it runs, you only use that machine for Quicken or for Adobe or whatever. And then Linux is your everyday go-to power machine. And you just keep that machine going for that one software that you need. Ted says he just installed Mint 20.0 on an old box. 
process created user with supervisor rights. Is there a different admin or supervisor account? No. That's the that's what you you get. But with Linux, it works that when I log into my Mint, I have supervisors right, but I don't have them until I need them. And when I need them, it asks for the password, and I have to give a password to use it. And there's another user way above that called root, and that's the one you don't want to be messing in. Um, so I am a uh, admin user, but I go in as a user, just like the user in Windows. And when I need to do things, password lets me do them in the command line or in the GUI. So that's, that's normal. But I could add users who are limited to what they can and can't do below me. It's really, it's, you know, it's very nice. I don't, I, I don't know on the Windows side, but in the Linux side, I can go in, take a user, and I have a whole list of um, what they can do. Use the printer, not use the printer. Install printers, not install printers. And in the comments here, I love it because, you know, the guy who's put in here, you could also create a virtual box is from my group and he gave a virtual box presentation and Perfect. he recommends you use virtual box because it is the easiest one to use. And he's looked a bunch out, so don't bother. And we did, he said, you could install windows within that. And he did that for us. He was on his windows 10 virtual box. He had three things in there. One of them was another windows 10. Yeah. And we went through all kinds of different stuff and everything. Um, you know, in the, oh. win in the Linux world, we even encourage people run virtual box with a version of the Linux that you're using and always put in the new programs in the virtual box, see how they run. If they don't crash your machine, okay, install them on the good one. Oh, crash machines. You might crash the, <laughs> don't, don't say that. You might crash the app. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but I was going to say, uh, uh, if you want to experiment with the different Linuxes and you want to have a brief period of distro jumping, put VirtualBox on your Windows machine and install the Linux distro there. When you're done with it, delete that VM and go on to the next. Exactly. It's uh, cheap entertainment. <laughs> and Paul has said, uh, thanks for asking my question. Your comment about C and D drives doesn't work with a laptop or PC with only one physical drive. Well, it didn't work with my Dell laptop that had an SSD that was a C and a physical drive that was a D either. Uh, his concern was whether a Linux installation created a separate partition automatically to store, to store your data. Yeah, not it, anymore. Yeah, I don't there, think when, they make a home directory anymore, do they? John? I do all the time because I go in and say, by default, it says, do you want to install it or something else? And something else, I say, this partition is my home, put it all there. Yeah, um, my setup's a little different because I have a file server and by default, all of my yeah. files are stored over there. But the same principle applies. I had to reload this machine with a new, ver a clean version of Linux oh, a couple months ago after <laughs> eight or nine years of just upgrading it, I decided to do a fresh install. But then when I was done, I reconnected the file server and all my files were there. Same deal. You, 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 you keep your files someplace that won't be impacted by a fresh install, right? whether and it's a file server or a partition. Yeah, and even on a laptop, I always have a C and a D drive. And then you just have to go in, like if it was a Windows one, you go into your Windows and you redirect your personal files to the D partition. You know, the hard drive still could, could you know, go down and you'd lose it all. But at least if you had to reinstall, you've got them separate. Um, some old, from, from Gary. Some older hardware, the chipset does not support virtual, virtualization. Older VMware provided software, but it would appear much of the virtualization now is based on hardware. Recommendations? I will explain that on my old laptop that's sitting over here that doesn't get used as much, um, I have a 64-bit processor, but this was built back in 2008, and it's not a true 64-bit. It runs 64-bit processes, but I cannot, I can install VirtualBox on there, 
but I cannot run 64 bit virtual machines. I have to do 32 bit. And that's because the virtualization is not included on that particular model of machine. I think nowadays you're, unless you get a really low end, you probably won't have a problem with that. Um, Mike, the answer to you is I can check back on our meetings, but gosh, gee, maybe you would like to have him give his presentation to your Linux SIG. Uh, just volunteering you again, Dave. Um, the other question was, uh, do Linux uh, groups belong to APC UG? The answer is no, because with Linux groups, you don't have to pay any dues or anything. Remember, it's all free. What we have are Linux SIGs, and I did send an email out last night to the president, APC UG rep, and program chair about scheduling uh, Bob G's security presentation for October, and also asking for response from groups that have Linux SIGs, because because of the Wednesday Linux workshops, Central Florida and Chicago Computer Society now have brand new Linux SIGs. Cool. And Dennis is confused by something John said. Shame, oh, John. Yeah. Elementary school. Mm. Uh, he, he was told by his computer group that when you install Linux distro like Mint, that the password you use when you first set it up is the authorized password that later allows you to make change, authorized changes to your system. But did John say that there is a higher level user you can set up? It's there, but you aren't supposed to touch it. There you um, go. And Dennis, I'd love to know which group you belong to. Yeah, Cal, I mean, uh, Orv, respond to that. Yeah, um, uh, with most of the uh, Debian-based distributions, at least all of the Ubuntu and spinoffs, uh, the first user has what they call sudo rights, S-U-D-O rights. Um, when you go to do something that requires root or administrative privileges, it will challenge you for your password before it will proceed. There is a separate root account that is the equivalent when you're sudo, but those don't use it. I do because I'm old school. Yeah. But um, uh, even on the command line, if you try and do something, if you proceed it with sudo, uh, it'll ask you for your password. So what that means is if somebody walks up to your, comp your Linux computer um, and it's not locked, shame on you, and they try to do something that requires administrative rights, like wipe out a drive or something, um, they won't be able to do it because they won't know your password, assuming you haven't loaned it to somebody. Yeah. yeah we just so a sudo is a temporary power. Yeah. And that protects you. So if you're going to do something, you say sudo administratively. And if later on you do something that, that you're just typing along and you can inadvertently do something because uh, administrative power is great in Linux. And you you want to be careful how you use it and not make a mistake. Yeah. So it's, it's just that one command that you're gonna issue. And after that, you, you no longer have super user power. It's a, also a security uh, feature if somebody was to break into your computer. Very good. Uh, an interesting second side, uh, I discovered what Orb just said about, you know, first user as opposed to others. Uh, we had to redo our classroom computers because it's been almost a year and a half since we've been in. And we installed a new user. We installed a second user because we wanted to be able to have our own user to be able to customize and whatever. And all of a sudden our customizable user we went to go do something and we couldn't. And we found out that when the first user created the second user, it didn't give them all of the rights. We had to go back in and give super user rights to us so we could do things. So there's another security thing that, you know, mm -hmm. other users are one level down, can do just about everything except superpowers. Security. It's funny, I just got a note from my Dave who I volunteered to give a presentation. He says, I'm glad you're recording this. I've been having a terrible internet connection this morning. Uh, I live on the west, the east side of the valley and he lives closer to the west side of the valley. So, ha, mm -hmm. uh, I don't have any more questions here except from Dale. 
who mentioned about peripherals. And if Dale wants a question answered about peripherals, I think at this point, you're gonna to need to put in the chat box which peripherals you're talking about or uh, ask it live. Over to Kurt Trout. I didn't have anything to add. Well, your hand was up, kiddo. Oh, heck, that, that was up a long time ago. Aren't, so, you, saying, aren't you saying thank you? You're not left-handed, are you? Uh, no, I am right handed. <laughs> this is a little impaired right now. Thank God, right? Yep, yep. Oh gosh, I have another question here. My computer specs show that I have secure, secure boot turned on. I have never turned it on. It came that way. Yep. Must I somehow turn this off in order to convert this machine? And how do I do that? Isn't secure boot one of those things with Windows 11 that you have to have on? That came with Microsoft and back into 10 and all the heart, all the companies that they convinced put on there. Um, if, if she's asked, if the person is asking if they can install Linux with secure boot on, I believe the most modern Linux distros can, no problem. Yeah, be, be, before you would have to turn that off because the intention was you aren't going to boot up anything that they don't say is secure and they say Linux isn't secure. So you try to boot to a thumb drive or a CD and it wouldn't work until you turn that off. Yeah, then you have had to go to, to the BIOS or the EFI before you start it up and turn it off. But as Arb says, uh, the keys, uh, most, most distros have the uh, security keys, so it doesn't matter. And Windows will not start unless you have it on. And I think it comes on by default when you yep. get a, a PC. Judy, check with Bill. Bill had the question a long time ago with his hand up, and I don't know if it ever got answered. And he put it in the chat box. Thank you. Uh, and Windows 11 does require the secure boot, boot to be turned on, as well as that TPM business that you can turn on. Uh, so some Windows machines obviously don't have it turned on. Anyway, I don't have any more questions as far as like, oh, shoot, here I have one. <laughs> Four years back, Pear OS, and I don't think I've ever heard you guys talk about Pear. It disappeared. Uh, suddenly announced this demise. Apparently, it was bought by an anonymous enterprise. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Yeah. It's probably running a whole bunch of stuff in the world now. Pear was the Apple version of Linux. Oh. See, apples, pears. And that was going to be a sarcastic comment on my part. Yeah, And Darn. it was around for a while and it was kind of neat, but then it did disappear for a while. And somebody just told me that it might be back. So somebody who is looking for a Mac looking uh, distro, well, pears would be one of the other ones. Um, now the Ubuntu, just to show you how neat some things are, the Ubuntu Mate version has the ability in one of its settings to change your desktop look to like one of six different ones. And you can make it look like a, a Windows machine and make it look like a laptop, make it look like the traditional Linux, make it look like the uh, Apple Mac machine or one other. So uh, rather than have to you know, go to different ones, how do you feel that day? Go into your settings, say, I feel like a Mac, and boom, it, it switches. Uh, there's a new one that just came out. It's not a new one, a new version of it. I think it's Makula or Makulalu that now has eight different options inside that you can choose what you want. Uh, the Zorn that somebody has mentioned, uh, it has four different choices, you know, like a Windows 7, a Windows 10, a Linux, and then four others, but you have to pay for those. So um, if you want the extra desktops, you pay their pro version, or you can just have the four. So, you know, everything's up for lots of uh, customization. And uh, finishing up, Dennis, the boot sequence is... If it's on my only choice is legacy versus Eufy, then for conversion to Linux, do I select the le legacy option in the BIOS? I don't think it matters. Yeah, it, it's, I think from when I've played with it, I do it both ways to see which one will work. There you go. But the problem is 
uh, you know, if you're dual booting, it has one issue. If you're doing straight Linux, not so hard. Um, and John oh, says, don't, you don't lose Donna. Donna, don't go away. No, I know she won't go away. She'll come back. Okay, she better. I'm sure. Otherwise, you won't reply to her email. Well, it's, I had this whole workshop. It's just for her. Uh, good job. Uh, John uh, says use elementary OS for the Mac version. And that was when we had our virtual box presentation. That was the Linux version as well as Windows 10 and an old version of Windows that we all dearly loved. Those were the three programs in the box. And over to Donna. So please unmute yourself. All right, I have two issues. I have two files I wanna put on my desktop that I can send from my other machine to Linux in email. Everything goes to this downloads folder, but I want these two items on my desktop. And it doesn't seem like I'm able to do that. I'm used to certain things that I can put on my desktop and in Linux, I can't find a way to do that. They always, I have to go search to find well, files or something. And it, part, it's, <laughs> part and of I know John, you don't like desktop things, oh, but I want right. these two items on my desktop. <laughs> okay, part of that though, is your browser. Your browser has an option. Where do you want downloads to go? By default, it goes to the downloads folder. You can probably go into your browser and say, ask me every time where my download should go. And then you could be able to say this time, download to the desktop, this time, download the download folder. But that's, that's you know, the direction is comes from the settings and downloads or in, in your browser. And you can move it from your download folder to your desktop with the file manager. I think you can just drag it in most distros. Yeah. yeah, you can drag That's it. That's what I wanted to know is how do I just, I could drag it out of, yeah. out of downloads? Or, okay. or yeah. in, your, in your file manager, you can drag it over to the doc, desktop folder. Mm -hmm. I, you know, my presentation I did today went, went from my PC cloud and I just drug it over to desktop and it showed up on the desktop. All right. Yeah. But, it, but it's, it's mostly when you're coming from the internet, your browser determines where files go and then you just move them afterwards. Okay. I, live, I live that with that on a daily basis. I download so much that you guys send me that um, it's into Word, it's into PowerPoint, it's into here, it's there. But don't forget if you're putting stuff on your desktop and you're backing up, don't forget to include your desktop as part of your backup. And also I learned that if you put a lot of photos on your desktop that slows the desktop from refreshing because it has to recreate those. I had a niece that had all of her photos on her desktop and she wondered why it took so long to switch from this to this. I moved them all back into the uh, picture folder and boy her desktop would open back and forth and refresh hey, so quickly. Worth the price okay. of admission today. Now, I had a second part of this question, and I noticed with the two beginning classes that I'm taking, that whatever they're looking for, they just type in the search bar. Yes. But they know the word for it. Right, right. <laughs> because Linux is like a foreign language to me, who's only known Windows. I don't know what word I even put in there. I have to sit and think, well, how right. do I find what I'm looking for? Yeah, you, you, that's you, kind of difficult. Yeah, you do the search like they do after you know what you're looking for. And that's <laughs> why I recommend, I recommend the desktops that the programs are listed in categories so that oh, you can yeah. go to the category that you think you want to find. And then once you find it, then you'll say, oh, that's what I'm looking for. Next time, type it in and... You don't have to go looking for it. But I agree. Another, there, there's there, there's a lot of words that I had to learn what I'm looking for. But once I learned it, okay. Cal? Yes. My favorite phrase is Linux alternative to. And then put up what is a, whatever Windows word you know. 
But yeah, Donna, it, it, Donna, don't don't worry about what they're doing. They're doing the next step up. When I teach, <laughs> I always teach the gooey, gooey first, and then the next step. And so I would say, if we're looking for something, I would always go to it in the menu system, and then show you. Okay, next time you want this uh, program, minute you open up your menu bar, just start typing the name that you know now. Okay, but in Windows, see, we never had to type the name so much. You know, you could just go look at your system and anyway, I, I understand. Right. But, but in, like in a foreign in, language. Yeah, but <laughs> yes. in Windows, when Windows now, that's what you're encouraged to do. Use that little icon down at the bottom with the magnifying glass and then you start typing. Okay. Yeah, and that's not comfortable when you're used to just being able to look for it. Anyway, right. okay. <laughs> What I would tell my students is when they were coming from seven to 10 and they went, oh, good grief, you know, I'm never going to get this. Well, I'd say you've been using computers for a thousand years and, you know, you know the name of what it is. So use the magnifying the glass and just the search thing and just type in what it is. And over time in Windows 10, you'll learn where everything is. But John, will yep. you let her know which distros have categories? She's she's on the one that does because she's using okay, Mint. Okay, that, that was what that's what I would use. I would right. go to the category and go down from there. Uh, Donna, are you with the Olympia Group? Yes, I am. Thank you so much. But she's um, also with the Central Florida Group, and she's also with the Chicago Group. Well, I'm taking oh. lessons from the other groups. <laughs> <laughs> They're allowing me to learn with them. My Olympia group uses Raspberry Pi, and as I understand it, that's a whole different ball game. So next month, you know, that's <laughs> it's beyond me at this yeah. point. Well, uh, and it's not totally because it's using a Linux operating system that will be very familiar when you see it. It's just that the Raspberry Pi and Orbs is, uh, is, is heading up next month's program is just the Raspberry Pi is just a, a little small little itty bitty miniature computer, but it's using a Linux operating system and it would be very similar okay well thank you for have having this mm -hmm. and i want to say as a real beginner if you've only used like windows everything was set up for you i never had to make an iso i never partitioned a drive i never used something like macrium backup i mean all of this is new to me so i feel like my brain is just <laughs> indulging in learning many new things it's good so for I, you yes <laughs> I, I, and isn't that how we stay young and or uh dave is Thank going you. to try to get his uh sprinkler system working with his raspberry pi so cool. he has that to share with you uh when you do that next month um security question uh when first starting the machine if you interrupt the grub and just after the bio screen, press escape key to interrupt the countdown using the up or down arrows to select a kernel, press A to append a kernel, press E to edit, press enter to accept, press B to boot. What was the question? Uh, is my question an artifact of many years ago or too advanced for this discussion? He's just uh, making a statement. Yeah. Pretty much many years ago. Oh, okay. John says any Linux app can be pinned to the panel, which is the equivalent of the Windows taskbar. Correct. Raspberry Pi is based on the husband and the wife whose sig lives next door. Uh, uh, Ted wants to know, can I install Chrome browser on my new Mint installation? No, 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 oh, no, oh, no. Oh. No? Why not? Install Are you Chromium. being serious or biased? Yes. Install Chromium. <laughs> it's it, yes, you can do it, but Chrome comes from Chromium, and Chrome is a Google product. And I'm saying use the Chromium one. But okay, so where where do you get that? It's okay. sometimes standard, or it's in your repository. Yeah, very good. And so. and, and uh, a, a, a comment from John. Yeah. It comes from Google and all sorts of spyware, but if you switch your default browser search engine from Google to DuckDuckGo, you're substantially more secure. Yep, yep. yep. And we're still going to have a presentation on DuckDuckGo 
and other secure browsers and search engines and stuff like that. If anybody is using any of the alternatives, please get in touch so you can be one of these fun loving panels like we're having today. Yeah. So answer back in, yes, you can go to your repository and install Chrome because Chrome does have some features that are Google based specific. Yeah. Uh, but like I, I run Chrome. The internet now. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's another thing in, in, in uh, Linux to deal with at a future time about whether you go through the repository or go through internet for installing stuff. Now, see, now that you've explained that, every time you say repository, my brain says App Store. Very good. That's how you learn. And Should over time, that. App Store will go away in my brain sooner or later. <laughs> Any other questions from anybody? I'm going to have to bail anything? out here in a minute, Judy. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. We're oh, just about I know. Ready. How difficult is it to recover a forgotten Linux security password? Or does <laughs> one... Oh, I'm sorry. Let me finish. Okay. Don't or forget. does one need to restore a backup of the OS to get back into it? <clears throat> well, I will say ahead, for every it. Linux distro, if you Google Linux meant how to recover password, you'll find it documented. And, That's not and, to say it will necessarily be easy. Sorry, John, go ahead. Oh, you're, you're done. You know, the, the biggest thing is if you throw a live CD into your computer, you can access all your files. But this doesn't, this isn't talking about Mint. It was just a general question. I can, yeah, I can, cool. I can put a, a Linux CD in your Windows computer and I can access every one of your files that you have and won't be stopped at, stop at it. Because, I knew that. Yeah. Um, no, you, what you can do is you have two choices. If your software, I mean, if your uh, uh, personal files are saved, just reinstall. Otherwise, you can go in with a CD, go into the command line, log in as your super user and change your password if you forgot it. Mm -hmm. Regarding the peripherals question, would you please define peripherals? Anything that Anything. plugs into your computer. Yep. Such as? Mouse, keyboard, camera, external drive. Printer. Printer, scanner, anything that plugs in, attaches to your base computer. Oh, and. Headphones. Yes, the, absolutely. Um, and there's people who have no idea how to drag and drop. So can you kind of visualize that for us or maybe bring up your screen and drag and drop something for us? It's, it's harder to show because you can't see it, but dragging and dropping means you use your left mouse, click on and hold, and then drag what you've got until you get to the spot and then let up on your finger. A key. So this is always uh, Linux Mint. And, and some others, the file manager, you can put two folders up at the same time in Windows and most other, then you have to start two instances mm -hmm. to the program twice and drag across. So if you don't know how to drag and drop, uh, do cut and then go the way you uh want and paste. <laughs> Judy you doesn't like never, that. Uh, ever, uh, uh, ever copy, copy and paste. Thank you. Wash yeah. your mouth out with soap for saying that. Oh. Yeah, SOS. Oh. Save yourself. Yes. When you when you drag and drop, I do that uh, all the time again. And I will drag and drop something from I'm putting a PowerPoint presentation together and I like the information on the internet. I have the web page open, the PowerPoint presentation open, and I can click and I can highlight and I can just drag that right over and plug it into my PowerPoint and then turn it into my very own words. You can yeah. do it from a Word doc to a Word doc and it's absolutely wonderful to be able to use it. And yeah. it's called Snap in Windows where you use your Windows key and your arrow keys to get two screens. Yeah. I, I just uh, make a point that back to with Donna teaching one way and another way. 
that I tend to do the copy paste because as I've been teaching with seniors, I'm running into people who are having problems with jitters. And if you can't control that left finger or that right index finger, you can be trying to drag something and, and it'll just drop along the way. And you sometimes, mm -hmm. where did it go? So I tell people the copy paste is the safe way. If you can handle drag and drop, fine. Yep. And erase the word cut from your vocabulary because if you jiggle and wiggle and it yep. drops in the crack, it is gone for good. Yep. And that's, I always say that, you know, uh, move it and then go back and get rid of it. Yep. Extra closes. step, but you'll keep oh. your sanity that way and your hair won't get so white. Yeah. Before we close and you say, I, uh, for those who are still here, uh, this has been great. Uh, the questions have been good. Some of them were a little bit above what I was kind of thinking, uh, but a lot of them were right on the mark. And I sure hope a lot of people are going away saying, I understand things better. I had a question asked, and this is, I had already planned to ask this even before today. Um, I'd like to know in the chat box, how many of you, would be wanting another kind of like an open question, more for beginners, not having some of the questions from up here. They can always be answered on the third Wednesday workshops. If, if you're interested in having uh, something else like this, you think it's worthwhile to keep it on the uh, stop and rest level, uh, put in the chat box and say, you know, this is something I, I think would be helpful to me and we'll have another one of these. And Orv would like to know how many people, put this in the chat box, how many people have tried Linux and GUN? Ooh. And he, he would like to know you people. So we can say maybe what do we need to do to get that going together? And don't forget, I would like the name of the group that uh, that would be uh, is it Dennis's group that did the uh, workshop on converting to Linux at his group? That would just be Inquiring Minds. Oh my God, I've got six new messages. <laughs> and the question was to me, doesn't matter whether you do it to Judy or me, I send all of my chats to Judy so she anyway. puts it together. Bill sends all his chats so she can see what was if there were problems in Zoom and stuff. So it doesn't really matter to Judy or to me, Judy gets all the chats. And I think Bill got his question answers. Why don't you cut and paste just because I would never, I never would let my students do that ever because if it's gone, it's gone. And it, it does take an extra step because you go ahead. If you don't want it where it was in the first place, you do have to go back to delete, delete it. But it's the same thing as wearing your seatbelt when you're driving a car. I agree. I'd like to thank Orv and uh, Cal especially for being part of the voice mm -hmm. um, and Bill and Judy for co-hosting and doing all that they do for this. Uh, we'll be back next month, the third Thursday in September, Wednesday. focusing on Raspberry Pi. Wednesday. Wednesday, thank you. Uh, third Wednesday um, and doing Raspberry Pi. And then we'll start planning for uh, another uh, Wednesday workshop for learning Linux. And I'll start, if there's enough interest, I'll consider scheduling a different one for uh, beginners again, so that we can keep it on your entry level that's trying to get you going. Oh my gosh, you know something? Nope. You guys both asked your questions and I don't have one person who's given me an answer. Well, I do. Dennis said he'd like another one and Jeff said he'd never go back to the dark side. But no, was it's, that, it's like was sending that Windows? Out, it's like sending it. Yeah, that was my version of it. This is like sending, I sent an email out and I asked for feedback and I don't ever hear from anybody, which absolutely dropped. Hey, my kindergarten preschoolers were better than you guys. <laughs> well, maybe they, they don't want, maybe they're not interested, but it's right. okay. Or no, they didn't we'll go to it. kindergarten. Yeah. One or the other. Oh, uh, Jay, I have uh, 
the, the Chicago group, when they met, uh, they did a video on installing. And I, I told uh, Tim that I was going to maybe be sending it out in a future uh, email. Uh, that isn't the greatest one. There were some mistakes, but he went completely from the first downloading of like Gparted to prepare your computer and then downloading Mint and installing Mint. So uh, we do have uh, access to a video that would show oh. that exactly. Is but it on you? Is it on YouTube? Uh, it's on. It's on their website. No, right now. it's on our uh, on our website, and it takes quite a while to download. Okay. If you'd like to, Jerry, you could send me the link. I could download it and I could upload it to. Um... John has the link. Yeah, I've got it. Oh, I, 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 I told I told Tim though that bef before we did it in big public, he would have to say oh, okay because he said there were some things that didn't work quite right. But I said it's still it's a good video that will tell people how to do it, and we can do it. And maybe that's what we'll do. One is right. do another uh, install because we can do a virtual install over Zoom and do a do that. I'm, I'm going to put that down in my little book. Okay, because I can upload it to um, APCUG's YouTube channel and just make it unlisted. Look, let me make a comment that um, you, you were at the meeting uh, uh, yesterday, John. Yeah. I'm working on an yeah. index for that video. Exactly. It kind of tells, you know, at minute 25, we were doing the G part, and at minute an hour and 10, we were doing the partitioning. So I'm not done with that yet. Right. So, you know, That's why I said it's, be, it's not going to But I'll be sending that to Tim when I'm done with that. Yeah, which I thought that was great. Couple, which should be in a couple of days, I would think. Yeah, that'd be good. But I, I like the idea of doing another step-by-step uh, -step slow install with, you know, taking the whole time. So that, that may be our next uh, beginner's one. Donna, unmute. Yes, I would like to see that again, too. I'd like to be able to keep it in the reference area where we just do the G parted and come up with that, you know, swap file and, the, and where you keep home. I've learned that word, home. Good. And the root. So I would, you know, I would appreciate that. And then we'd have it on a reference like on APCUG. So when my I get another computer and try to do this, I have a quick way to go and, and refresh and, and, and know how to do that again. Great. I only did it once, you know, it's, yeah. it's still, it's still not native, I guess is what I want to say. So I would love another presentation on that. I'll look at, I, I'll I'm, look at I'm the learning. Wednesday. Good. I'll, I'll check <laughs> the you. Wednesday schedule and see about scheduling an extra one again. I like that idea. My Thank you. My plan with uh, getting the list of uh, Linux SIGs is I have a groups sharing meetings document on the website and I have highlighted the groups that are doing uh, hybrid meetings in case somebody wants to check out, you know, what a group is doing because they're going to think about hybrid. And I would also uh, put the Linux SIGs on that so people could go to the group sharing meetings, if the Linux SIG will let it be shared. So it would be all encompassing. And we definitely could have a, a place on the website, a Linux place. We could put it, you know, with your Penguin column. Mm -hmm. uh, I am uh, going to add two new things, links to Bob G's Windows 11 <clears throat> videos that he's been putting together and another one on scams and phishing and all that good kind of stuff with links to the um, FTC bulletins that come out almost every day on yeah. that kind of stuff. So uh, let me know if you want that. It's no biggie, so Judy, to speak. Judy, yes? another presentation that you might want to do is uh, VirtualBox and installing Linux with that. I would Windows might Windows might take a little long, but uh, VirtualBox might be quick. Yeah, I would use VirtualBox to do the Linux installation on the, you know, the next program. Okay. Because it makes it easy to be able to, you know, do Zoom without having to have a second camera. Okay. Okay. Uh, Gary says, did, did I misunderstand? I use Raspbian, Kali, Red Hat, 
and MS Windows Pro, Windows for Adobe CS and AutoCAD. Almost everything else I can find on Linux. Yay. So, so there, I, there are matches for some of the Adobe products, but I don't know about AutoCAD, whether there's a Linux version of that. Yeah. And Donna has her hand raised again. You know me in questions. Okay, Mrs. Good job. Judy, I have never seen your uh, list. So it's of all the different sites or groups that allow people. So is that on, in, that must be somewhere. And Actually, then, actually you need to jump all over your president for that because I, well, all the officers received uh, notification that it would be up there. And it's apcug2.org member benefits. And oh my gosh, it's called group sharing meetings. You just get simplistic titles from me to describe what it is. Yeah. Okay, and then back to John when he says he's going to do this in a virtual box. I have never ever used a virtual box. You have to show me how you got the virtual box before you start doing the next part. Sure, I, that, okay. would, that would be it because you know you would want to use virtual box. Uh, you know, in case you'd said, "Oh, I'm using Mint," but I heard somebody else say they really like this distro, so throw it into a virtual box, try it out, and you'll say, ooh, I do like it better than Mint. Okay, John. Okay. There's our, there's our yep. Wednesday workshop with what Mark volunteered to do, and then you follow up with the second half on... What Mark volunteered to do? The presentation that you said that people probably wouldn't be interested in. Oh, installing? Yeah, I'm, no, I'm virtu using virtual boxes. Oh yeah, we'd do virtual box and then use yeah. it to install Linux. Yeah, that would be our next one for beyond, maybe beyond the third. No, I was day. thinking for a different. Yeah, me too. Another, right, okay. Yeah. I have to look, I have to check with Judy first to see what's on her schedule. Uh, nothing. <laughs> We're running out of presenters, huh? Well, kind of. Okay, we still have that, you know, great mm -hmm. idea of having a panel of people talking about the office suites and one week doing different kind of word processors, one week different kind of present uh, in, uh, presentations and different kinds of spreadsheets. That'll take three. I have emails out. We'll try. But again, if anybody would like to do something or have an idea, or like I do, volunteer one of your members to do it. <laughs> Let me know. Well, if anybody else doesn't have any comments, uh, I appreciate everybody being here. This is a benefit of your membership to your club, who's a member of APCUG. Okay. Yep. And, nope. Yep. Yep. Um, a question. Do you know what open office is? Hey. This would be an opportunity. Remember, I sent you that email and said, oh my gosh, I just found out about this. Are you gonna wanna put it in your presentation? And you said, it's already in there. But you have LibreOffice, OpenOffice, and what was that other one that I thought was so cool that you already knew about? Free Office. Free Office, so there's three Office who has. Free Office is exactly like using Microsoft Word. And it's free. Who knew? It's partially free. The base Gosh. part is free. All the benefits you have to pay for. All right. We will see you in September sometime. And uh, watch for another email for registrations. And we'll be back in November for a double uh, two-session VTC and our annual meeting. You'll want to attend that. Uh, and then anytime you have ideas for presentations that you'd like to see, like to give, uh, please give us the ideas and we'll find somebody to do it or you volunteer to do it. Right. And you see, it's no big deal. We just fly by the seat of our pants. What can I tell you? I'm talking. Yep. Yep. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Judy and Bill, make sure you save once again so you have all the chat and we'll see everybody 
at the next time. Thanks so much for attending and joining us. Thank you, Cal, R, Orv, and John. Too cool. And I have a little note here. Oops, you're gone. I no, have I'm a not. note here that says chat has been saved. Check.